So it's just taking time for these excesses to be wrung out of the system, but we still have a massive asset bubble uh, in stocks, a massive asset bubble in credit. Um, and, and, and those things have to be um, equalized. They have to be wrung out, normalized. And that's not going to change. That, that has not happened yet. It will happen. And my portfolio and strategy is about getting the timing correct. But, but please understand, I am very negative on the foundation. I have been, I remain very negative on the foundation of this economy, which is built on asset bubbles and debt. That, that has not changed and it's not going to change until they correct. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter and, of course, your host for this conversation. I'm really looking forward to catching up with an old friend of the channel. He hasn't been on in about seven months, so it's time to catch up and uh, get a reality check. What is happening in the economy or how is the economy doing? How are the markets doing and where are things headed? It's uh, none other uh, than Michael Pento of Pento Portfolio Strategies joining us here. But uh, before I switch over to my guest, you guys know the spiel. Kindly hit that like and subscribe button. And it helps us out tremendously reach a wider audience and grow the channel it is much appreciated now without much further ado michael it is great to see you again it's a good time to catch up good to see you kai yeah we got lots to talk about uh, as i mentioned we last spoke about seven months ago and uh, i think we need to revise some of your calls you've made but also like let's get a reality check on the economy and maybe we'll start there like let's get an economic reality check what, what does the current economic reality look like michael well, it's it's uh, it's just taking a long time, Kai, for the broader averages to fall. You know, um, I run money for a living, so if I was short the market, like some people claim that I am, I would be out of business. I, ha I haven't been short the market since 2022, um, and I've been um, cautiously optimistic on the stock market and the portfolio, um, but but. Let's be clear, the average stock hasn't done much at all. Uh, if you look at the Russell 2000, it hasn't done much since the end of 2000 or start of uh, 22, the start of the end of 21. Um, sectors in the market are hurting, like the banking, sec banking sector, regional banking sector. So it hasn't been a, a overall crazy bull market like it was for NVIDIA. If you want to extrapolate that return in for the overall market, it, it looks like we're doing great. But there are sections of the market, par parts of the market that are struggling. Um, uh, but we are not participating in that. We have a five sector portfolio that ranges from deflation to stagflation or hyperinflation. We were in sectors three and four a few months ago after we spoke. We our portfolio participated in the upside there. We've then since went back into sector two very recently, which is disinflation. And I think there's a very good chance that we could head into deflation um, in the very near future. But I'll let the model that I created called the inflation, deflation, and economic cycle model and strategy, I'll let that model dictate when it's time to get short the portfolio. And as I want to stress, I have not been short the stock market since 2022 in, in a net basis. When you say like short the market, is that more of a sector rotation or would you really buy put options? Maybe you can explain that a little bit. What do you mean by that? Okay, so when I go short the market, since I um, I have uh, over a thousand accounts in my uh, my uh, purview, is that I buy, and, and, much, and many of these accounts are retirement funds. So we cannot do options. We cannot buy options, uh, cannot buy puts. We could write options, but I don't do that because I think that's... Uh, sort of limits your upside. What I do is I actually buy ETFs that go up when the market goes down. And a couple of the ETFs that I have actually um, will do the shorting in a type three margin account for me. Um, I also have uh, gold as a hedge. I have yield curve steepeners as a hedge. Um, there's a anti-volatility fund that I use. So I, and I am in some of those things that I just mentioned right now. But as an out and out short, which I, I use, like I said, these uh, either inverse ETFs, which I you have to go in and out of them. You can't hold them very long. Inverse ETFs um, or the straight short ETFs, 
I own none of those right now, except for a very small short in high yield. I am short the high yield market because I just don't see any upside there at all. Makes sense. Makes sense. It's such a diverse market. It's such a volatile market. So I'm curious. We'll talk maybe volatility in a second because I want to talk uh, inflation rate. I think that's a, that's a really important one. Um, I'm going to bring up something on the screen here. It's the Trueflation <laughs> website real quick because Trueflation is telling us that we're already in a deflationary scenario or, or not. Sorry, not deflationary scenario. Let's call it like we're below the Fed's target rate of 2%. That's what I meant by that. Apologies. Um, but we're below the target rate. So, of course, my question is like how realistic is that number and B is the Fed behind the curve already because okay, so a lot of questions there first of all you're, what you're seeing there on your screen is disinflation not deflation as you corrected exactly. yourself as so it's disinflation it's exactly what we are hedged for which when you think about the five sectors that range between deflation and hyperinflation disinflation has its own bucket as well that's sector two so you want to avoid um high volatility sectors in the portfolio you, you want to avoid high beta, you want to avoid things like tech or small caps when you are disinflating. But when you retreat to sector one, which would be deflation, which you would, you would see a minus sign on that chart, then you want to head towards the, the four horsemen of the economic apocalypse, as I call them. So you want to have only treasuries, you want to own the US dollar, and you want to be short the market, high levels of cash, and you could actually have a yield curve steepener. So uh, th those are the only things you really want to own when you're in sector one. We're just not there yet. And the reason is, Kai, you know, it, it, and, and again, I want to stress, I, I might sound like a Cassandra here <laughs> calling for the end of the world, end of the world. I'm not calling for the end of the world. I'm just saying, I'm just stating the obvious. And again, I run money for a living. So if I was net short the market on a persistent basis since 2022, I would be out of business. So I have a model that tells me when to get net short. We're just not there yet. But we haven't solved any of the problems. The problem is that it's taking a lot of time to get all the liquidity out of the system. So, for example, um, from 2020 to 2022, the Fed's balance sheet, also known as high powered money, went up by five trillion dollars. The M2 money supply increased by six trillion dollars. In two years, that's some 30 something, but like 35% of uh, increase in M2 money supply in two years. That just has never happened before. And if you see a lot of that money went into the financial system, went into the banking system, they're loaded with excess reserves. They parked, they parked those reserves at the Fed. There was two and a half trillion dollars in the reverse repo facility. Uh, that's down to 300 billion today. So it's and the M2 money supply stopped rising. It has, hasn't uh, it's, it's kind of stayed uh, flat for a couple of years now. So it's just taking time for these excesses to be wrung out of the system. But we still have a massive asset bubble uh, in stocks, a massive asset bubble in credit. Um, and, and, and those things have to be um, equalized. They have to be wrung out normalized. And that's not going to change. That, that has not happened yet. It will happen. And my portfolio and strategy is about getting the timing correct. But, but please understand, I am very negative on the foundation. I have been, I remain very negative on the foundation of this economy, which is built on asset bubbles and debt. That, that has not changed and it's not going to change until they correct. And by the way, they should correct 40% just to bring those ratios of home price to income ratios and stock price, stock prices as a percentage of the economy. 40%, both those things should correct just to bring them back to an historical normal ratio. That's all. That's a big downside. There wouldn't be a yeah. finan there wouldn't be a solvent financial, uh, there wouldn't be a solvent financial system. Uh, wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a, uh, financial institution around pension plans, hedge funds, mutual funds, most of them would be bankrupt along with the country. I, I mentioned, I asked you about the Fed and maybe I'll just repeat that part because it was a long, long question or, or what do you call it? A box question with too, too many little boxes in there. What's the Russian thing where the little things come out? Is it called babushka, mamushka? Where like there's little figurines in them. It's like yeah. that's sort of what my question was, like too much in one. Right. Um, but let me ask you, is like the, the Fed's role in all of this, like does the Fed uh, even stand a chance and is the Fed already behind the curve here? 
Okay, I'm sorry I didn't answer that part of the question. So the Fed is definitely behind the curve. The free market has already moved the 10-year note down to 3.8%. The Fed funds rate is 5.3. An effective Fed funds rate is 5.3. <laughs> and the 10-year note is 3.8%, 3.9 around there. So even if the Fed were Kai, even if the Fed went into some kind of quasi-aggressive rate cutting cycle. So suppose they went from four and a quarter to four and a half, that's their target range now, down to um you know, say, I'm sorry, five and a five and a quarter, five and a half down to say four. That's still would be an inverted yield curve. And it's and the market, the free market has already priced that in. The Fed has well telegraphed this decline in, in borrowing costs. So I mean, yes, of course, people do borrow at the Fed funds rate. So um uh, home equity lines of credit, credit card, auto loans, they would be f affected positively by that lowering of interest rates. But Every other borrowing, corporate debt and um, and mortgage debt, that's it, it, they've already crashed. So I think the danger is here's the danger is Wall Street has priced in 14 percent earnings growth for 2025, 12 percent for two, for this year, um, and it's, not, it's just not going to happen. Um, the the economy is growing very slowly. It's grow it's growing in the with a one percent handle, according to my calculations. The leading index of economic indicators just came out today and, and showed that we should be growing you know, well below trend. Inflation has come down, as you, as you say it, uh, uh, as the official um, measures have it, below 3%, from 9%, which was in reality 18%, the way I calculated it, um, the way shadow stats calculated it, it was close to 20% as well. So you're just not going to get the revenue and earnings growth predicted. So you have this you have this massive asset bubble in stocks. They're trading at 190 for 190 percent um, market cap of equities to GDP. Uh, massive bubble in real estate, which is clinging by uh, the, the skin of its teeth. So um, the fact that the the Fed's balance sheet went up so much, the fact that money supply went up, is keeping these things afloat. But as you see, from 1980 to 2002. That period of time, we had a positive, real Fed funds rate. And in other words, money costs something when you borrowed it. <laughs> but from 2002 to 2022, um, it was negative. And, and, and in fact, and sometimes it was negative 8%. So we, we, that has created the massive leverage we see in the system. And if you look at things like the Japanese yen, and the yen carry trade is just one tiny part of the bubble that that burst that burst i mean one tiny section of the of the imbalances that exist in the economy today is the yen carry trade that bubble burst for a week and it sent the nikkei dow down 20 percent in five days or, or it's five or six days trading days um so let's let's just i just want to go through a couple of things global debt this is about the leverage in the financial system. Global debt is now $307 trillion. That's 340% of GDP. It's up $100 trillion in the last decade. Collateralized loan obligations, which are, which are loan, bank loans to highly leveraged corporations, up 366%. Private credit. This is a new phenomenon, private credit. It didn't even exist prior, prior, prior to the global financial crisis. That's up 1,600%. Corporate debt is at a record percent of GDP. You, and as you see, the way I see it, the bottom four quintiles of investors are struggling to live because of the inflation. And let, can I just talk a little bit about inflation? Oh, for sure. Uh, inflation has come down. So the rate of change of inflation has, or the rate of change, the rate of change, second derivative, has gone down from, say, 9% to 2.9%. CPI. But the level of prices has already eviscerated the middle class of this country. In fact, the bottom four quintiles are struggling to eat and to have medical care. They're, they're cutting back on food and medical costs, medicine. And the fact that rates are still going higher, uh, that, that inflation is still going higher from here, that's the real problem. And the fact that it's rising at 2.9% year over year, it's still even above the Fed's asinine 2% target. 
the target should be zero in my opinion, but their target is 2%. So you've already wiped out the bottom four quintiles, the top quintile, the top 20% is clinging to asset bubbles and that fuel is running dry. I've been getting bombarded lately on Instagram with uh, real estate ads or real estate reels um, talking about how the, the market is completely out of whack already. Like a lot of empty houses in Florida, um, prices dropping and people just forecasting which markets are going to be hit the hardest. I think that's a big momentum change, like at least in my Instagram feed. Uh, are you witnessing something similar on the real estate side there? Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, real estate has to drop by 40 percent. Just to come back in, in line, and you see listings are are listings are rising pretty significantly here in Florida. I also have a house in in New Jersey, and the, and it, things seem to be a little bit better there. Don't forget the home price that I I purchased a home here in in Florida, whose price appreciated by about a hundred percent in a year and a half. Wow! Before I before I bought it, so this is post COVID. So everybody moved to uh, Florida and Texas, and um, if you see. Um, uh, like for instance, corporate corporate chapter eleven bankruptcies, commercial bankruptcies are up forty percent year over year. Credit card loans are rising. Auto loan delinquency rates are spiking. Um, about fifty percent on on the uh, credit card side too. So um, the the consumers under a lot of pressure. Their their balance sheets are under pressure. The only quintile holding up the economy now barely is the top quintile. They're clinging to asset bubbles. And the um, monetary fuel, by the way, has been cut off. Hmm. They're, 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 the Fed's balance sheet is shrunk from $9 trillion to $7 trillion. Um, bank lending standards have tightened. The yield curve remains inverted. Um, the, the level of real Fed funds rate is now 2% for over a year. And even if the Fed was to cut rates, down to 4% from 5.3, there's, it would still be in a positive <laughs> uh, position. And that's always been disastrous. It, it's always led to recessions and been disastrous for asset bubbles. So I don't see I don't see any change now because asset bubbles have never been this high before. We've never had concurrently an asset bubble in credit, stocks, and in real estate. <clears throat> Michael, you mentioned the leading economic indicators, and I just saw the press release that you referred to earlier. And there's a there's a sentence; it's a direct quote from one of the employees there at the conference board. But she says the LEI continues to fall on a month over month basis, but the six month annual growth rate no longer signals recession ahead. How does that fit together? What you just mentioned? She just said that she says that all the time. But what she, <laughs> if you continue reading, she continues to say that we expect growth rates to be falling. And she expects Q, I think Q3 was to be about around 0.6% and Q4 at 1% and change. So, I mean, we can, qu we can quibble over whether it's a recession or not, but the fact of the matter is the U.S. economy is weak and getting weaker. That, that is a fact. And I will tell you, if we have, if we have a problem in the repo market, or, the, or this, this is what my model looks at, we look at problems in the, in the money markets, most closely. And if we have a problem in the repo market, if there's another yen carry trade debacle, you could see how fast these financial, the financial leverage can unwind. It happens instantly. Um, so I, I expect, and I mentioned it already, CLOs, private credit, commercial real estate, those are massive bubbles that could unwind very quickly. Um, and, and one of the catalysts for that could be is the fact that we only have $300 billion left in the reverse repo facility. So if the Fed, if the Fed has a real positive Fed funds rate, if, you are shrinking, if you're shrinking the balance sheet and the balance sheet has shrunk $2 trillion, still got more to go, it's still shrinking on a, on a weekly basis. Um, banks are, have tightened their lending standards. No one really, you know, there's the, the transaction market for real estate is completely frozen over. There's a lot of listings piling up, but nobody wants to really move. They don't really have to yet. Um, so all eyes are on the labor market because when the labor market begins to, to um, when the unemployment rate begins to rise, and it already has done so, uh, tends to keep going. Initial claims are rising, although that undulates uh, week to week. Um, you might see the 
you know, I saw that it's 20, 25% of all homes are owned by investors in the past few years of the of transactions. There was one year where, and one data source said that 60% of all single family home purchases were done by an investor. I think it was 2023, the last quarter of data. So um, there's a lot of inventory, <clears throat> a, a lot of, excuse me, a lot of shadow inventory out there. So if you're no longer renting your house because the renter lost his job and has to, and, and can't pay rent, and then you say, well, I'm not getting an income stream from this house. I'm up 100% in it over the past few years. And I don't really need it. It's like a stock. I just don't, you know, I don't need it to live. I'm just going to put it on the market. There's a ton of real, uh, of inventory can come on the market for real estate. So also, um, if you look at F FHA loans, th th I think they're up 900%. So these are people that don't put any, that put three and a half percent down with very low credit scores. Uh, that the government really learned their lesson, huh? Didn't they? <laughs> So these are these are things I'm I'm looking for. I'm, I'm myopically focused on the labor market, the money markets. Those that's going to tell me when to get net short in the portfolio for the first time since 2022. Just not not time yet. I'm not going to tell the market what to do. <laughs> My model will tell me when the market is ready to crash, in a, in, a, in a in a fashion that I could trade, and it's just not happening yet. But we should be close. Let's, let's speculate on the unemployment rate. We've, we're already seeing a four handle on it. Like, when when do you think it, it is broken? Like, is it six percent? Is it seven percent? Is it maybe four and a half percent? What are your no, thoughts on that? I, I would say as it approaches five percent, and initial claims approach two seventy per week would be enough to trigger me to, um, if not become net short in the portfolio, um at least take on some shorts, straight shorts in the portfolio. I'm also looking at credit spreads. They, they you know, they spiked incredibly during the yen carry trade, but they've come all the way back down to 3.3%. They were close to 5% from the low threes. Um, also look at financial conditions. They were easing for a long time, but they've now stopped easing. Kind of, they haven't tightened yet, but they just stopped easing, but you have to stop easing before you tighten. So, uh, so we're, we're, get, we're getting there again. You know, you think about $6 trillion increase in M2 money supply. You know, it just takes a lot of time for that liquidity to get, uh, you know, absorbed into the economy. So I'm patient. Uh, my portfolio is up, you know, significantly this year. Uh, thank God. And um, I just, uh, you know, I, I, I'll just wait to get the timing correct. I'm not going to force the issue. <clears throat> question popped into my head and I'm hope I'm on the right track here, but how much of that six trillion dollars was pumped into the domestic economy and how much was pumped into international markets, being it it's, uh, it's the, it's packages the, or anything that might come back into the US as inflation? It's the right? empty money supply. So it's it's domestic money supply. So okay. uh, oh, you, you have swap you have swap agree agreements, but then we you know we exchange dollars and they give us money. But it Six trillion dollars is the number that I'm focused on. It's never happened before. We have never had a six trillion. And by the way, it, it from 1913 to 2007, the Fed's balance sheet. So this is the creation of the Federal Reserve from 1913 <laughs> to 2000 and the end of 2007 it was 800 billion dollars. That was high powered money. This is the reserves and the banking system. This is part of the base money supply, which you can see, you know, so it's Fed credit plus physical coins and currency and circulation, $800 billion. And then in, in, in from 2008 to 2022, so 14 years, it went from $800 billion to $9 trillion. And that's banana Republic <laughs> style, man. That's just disgusting. And, you know, they, and you think about the, 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 the six trillion dollars in helicopter money that was handed out five trillion of that like i said was printed it just it, i mean it's just nonsense how we've financialized our economy and there's a price to be paid the price to be paid was inflation and the destruction of the middle class that price is that that price has already been paid for or it's being paid for right now kai what 
we have to we have to prosecute that fight. We have to vanquish inflation, in my opinion, to get back to some kind of normalcy. And it, it will entail an asset bubble crash. It will entail a recession slash depression. It'll be very destructive. Um, but we need that to get back to normal. Alternatively, which is what I'm afraid is going to happen, is we're going to we we started down that road to normalization, but we're going to truncate it before it's complete. We're going to have a problem in the money markets. The Fed's going to blink. They're going to start printing money massively, increase its balance sheet. There might be some form of helicopter money. And we're going to see inflation soar from it, the level it already is, thus completely wiping out the middle class of this country, uh, you know, possibly forever. And, you know, when you wipe out the middle class of a nation, this is the, these are the people that go to work every day. These are the people that produce things. Uh, you can't have a viable uh economy you know it's an existential threat to the life of the country when you wipe out the middle class and we are very close to going down that road again that's the fact but one question i wrote down is is a very generic one almost but is the u.s broke like is that is that a simple yeah, well, is that well, too you, simple yeah, of a question so, you, so no it's not it's a, it's not bankrupt it's insolvent there's a difference uh bankruptcy has is a court matter it's chapter seven or chapter eleven uh, if you look at assets minus liabilities, if you look at the, the nation's assets minus its liabilities plus unfunded liabilities, it's it's uh, it's upside down. We we owe more money than we have than what we have. And if you look at um, we we have our our debts are more than our assets, assuming you could sell those assets at those prices. So it's you know the debt the debt is the debt. The asset prices fluctuate in value. So we're definitely in, in an insolvent nation. But if you look at things like um, uh, total debt as a percentage of revenue, which is revenue is what you really have to spend. That's what the government has to spend. They can't spend GDP. They can increase. Um, they say, okay, I'm now taxing 100% of GDP. Well, you're not going to get your, your GDP will go to zero and you'll get nothing. You know, Art Laffer showed that on his napkin. So, um, and I agree with that. So you can't, you can't tax the GDP. You can tax the taxes, the tax rate, what you're bringing in in revenue, it, that, our debt is 725% of our revenue. And, 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 you know, you go to a bank and tell them that, you know, uh, this is my salary. I already owe 725% of my salary and I want to borrow some more money. The bank will just, you know, they'll probably, when you give you a lollipop, they'll just kick you out. they give you, just a kick in the ass and get you out of the door. Um, but it's, it's another thing that we're adding 40% to our revenue. So if you look at our revenue that we have, the government revenue, we're adding to the debt by the debt by the annual deficits 40% of our revenue. Think you got to think about these numbers. And you you asked me if we're solving <laughs> it's a train wreck. It's an absolute train wreck. And and we have a two trillion dollar deficit, a trillion dollars in interest payments during what we supposedly have is a soft landing, beautiful economy. Guy, what's gonna happen? I'm glad you asked the question. What would the deficit be if we have a recession? It would be the annual deficit will rise between five and six trillion dollars. If if historical you know, it, it, looking back on the previous two recessions and the increase in the deficit percentage wise, we're looking at a possible six trillion dollar annual deficit. Yeah, we are insolvent. A little, little more near term. September 18th is the next Fed meeting and market expectations is they're going to cut by 25 basis points. The question is like how much is already priced into the market and what does 25 basis points actually do? Yeah, we, we, we talked about this. So we're, if the Fed funds rate is 5.3 and they cut right. by 25 basis points, I, I think the stock market yeah. would, would fall. And I think long-term yields would rise, maybe even short-term yields. I, I mean, 25 basis points? The market has priced in a 150 basis point reduction cycle happening very quickly. And, it, and they would only surprise the market by doing that and going, uh, going more than that, excuse me, going over that in the context of a market that is an economy that's in recession. So, you know, if, that's, if, if they do cut by 200, 300 basis points, I can, I can assure you, that's a panic move. It's in the context of chaos in the markets and in the economy, and you're not going to be happy uh, just being your 60-40 uh, investor. <laughs> it won't be good news. 
So the more, like I said, the Fed is going to be follow, is going to be following the market lower. So that's why you see bad news is just bad news now. Bad news is bad news. There's bad news that listen, the Fed is still above its target. It cannot panic and cut rates because we still have an inflation problem, and panic rate cuts aren't happening unless we have complete turmoil in the economy. And you can't have 14% earnings growth when you have a recession and the economy and markets are in turmoil. So something's got to give here. And the stock market is priced to perfection, in my opinion. There are certain sectors I'm invested in. It's bond and bond proxies. That's what we have in sector two, which is disinflation. We have gold. We have bonds, short-term government bonds going out about three years on the, on the yield curve. We don't want long. I don't really want long duration because at 3.8%, I don't think I don't think it can go much lower or for very long. Could go lower, but not for very long. Because in response to a six trillion dollar deficit, I don't think long term rates are going to stay that. And, and if the Fed comes up with helicopter money, and the Treasury come up with helicopter money again, I don't think inflation is going to stay at two and a half, three, you know, three percent. It's going to go back to ten and double. It's going to go to double digits. In reality, much higher. And who knows when it's going to end? Who who's going to ever believe the Fed that they're actually going to go and start? fighting inflation and and prosecuting and vanquishing that goal and, and conquering inflation. I don't think it's going to happen. Who's going to believe them? It's going to be clear. You know, the Fed cut rates uh, to 0%, actually 1%, because we had a NASDAQ bubble the crash. Then they cut them to 0% because we had a crash in the real estate market. All one-time, once-in-a-lifetime events. Then we had a once in a lifetime pandemic and the Fed went back to zero. If we have another crisis, I don't care what it is, even if it's another pandemic, people are going to make the conclusion, listen, pandemics are happening all the time. People are going to say economic debacles and crises are having happening all the time. And the Fed cannot ever adequately fight inflation without destroying the economy. So inflation is going to run intractable. That's my, that's my opinion. And that's why, I, I, that's why I think gold is going to be a very important part of anybody's portfolio, both heading into this recession and especially after the recession. You open the door, I'm going to walk through it, Michael. We got to talk gold. <laughs> $2,500 as we speak right now. So it is extremely high. It's pretty much trading at all time high levels. Um, Obvious question is, what, why is it trading there? What's the gold price telling us already that we might not know? Or what is it foreseeing that could happen here? Um, besides central well, bank buying, of course. But uh, what, what is driving gold right now, in your opinion? Well, you, well, you, what always drives gold is, is, a, is falling nominal and real interest rates. That's what, what gold is most concerned of. And you see that the rates are falling. If rates have crashed. The long-term rates have crashed. So gold actually absolutely loves that. Um, I think the next leg is a recession that'll take rate rates a little bit lower on the long end, a lot lower on the short end. Um, because I think the fed funds rate could go to 2% right now. The two year note is over four. So that's wonderful. But you hit the nail on the head when you, you asked me the question, you said, is the, is the United States an insolvent country? Insolvent nations tend to have a very bad relationship with a currency and a very bad relationship uh, with gold. Gold, is the true revealer of how well a nation is doing with its uh, stability. And we're doing a very poor job of it. So I expect gold, listen, if you ask me if, if Bitcoin, which is a 64 uh, bit uh, private key, which has letters and numbers in it that exists, is ex exists virtually, uh, <laughs> um, if that could be $60,000 a unit, then gold could be uh, 5,000. Or six thousand dollars an ounce. That's strong. That's strong. What does the U.S. dollar look like in that scenario, then, Michael? I think the U.S. dollar, um, and I'm not just talking about so much against other flawed fiat currencies, because that's not how you measure a currency. You measure a currency against gold. Uh, look, you want to look at a chart. Put up the Japanese yen against gold up up until a few weeks ago. Uh, I think I think the dollar crashes against the price of gold crashes. It's been doing so. And I think it, that that could accelerate after the recession. And if I'm correct, and the Fed and Treasury blink and say that the money markets are frozen, you can't float commercial paper. Um, 
there's no transactions in the repo market. Um, they're dysfunctional if, the, if, if there's any at all. And we have to launch some kind of ZERP, QE, and helicopter money regime once again. I think the dollar crashes, especially against hard assets. I think it's really fighting to keep uh, also the world reserve currency status as well. Is that, uh, of course, that's another threat to the U.S. dollar. But do you, do you think that role of the U.S. dollar globally will diminish if that happens, which could be pretty much it almost any been. day now? Uh, Kai, it's, hap it's happening. It's not, yeah. not, that's not a prediction. It's happening. I mean, people, other nations have made the calculation that I cannot park my reserves, my currency reserves in U.S. dollars because they can be confiscated. They're subject to... Um, you know, like I said, confiscation. Uh, so in that scenario, what I would rather do is take my excess, my trade surplus, instead of buying dollars and buying treasuries, which can be sur subject to tariffs. And um, I'll just buy gold with it and hold the gold myself. And then, I'm, then I'm, I, I obviate the ability of the U.S. to sanction me. That's no. what's happening. There's no, I mean, that's not a theory of mine. It was a theory of mine years ago, and now it's a fact. It's just happening. Yeah. Well, a lot of stuff that has been forecast, and then uh, you know, let's go, uh, what do you call it? Like uh, not non mainstream media, especially a lot of YouTube interviews and YouTube channels, is coming to fruition, which is not being reported in mainstream media, which is being widely ignored, in my opinion. And uh, I'm glad you, know, uh, you, making, you bring that to we, our attention. Guy, if you're getting your news from the mainstream financial media, you, 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 listen, I'll give you one example. I'll leave you with this because I know we got to wrap up here. So the mainstream financial media went bonkers, absolute bonkers on the retail sales report that was released last week. Oh, the, it blew up. It, I think it was up 1%. Um, much better than expectations. The consumer is so resilient. And I said, wait a second. Let me look, let me look at the data here. So retail sales increased by 2.7% year over year. That, that's a nominal figure. CPI increased by 2.9% year over year. So in real terms, the consumption on the part of the consumer is negative. It's, it wasn't, wasn't that it was great, wasn't that it was booming, it's down in real terms. So, you know, but no one, no one has mentioned that. I'm, I'm writing about it this week. Uh, I'll put a, I'll put something out this week about it, but it, you you got to get your news from sources that are independent. Listen, I just want to make me and my clients money, and whatever bullish, bearish, stagflation, deflation, I don't care. Wherever it leads me, I will go. Uh, wherever that model leads me, it was built to detect the second derivative of inflation in the context of the health of the economy. That's how I think about investing. That's very crucial because you could. You could say the economy is horrible, but we're in hyperinflation. And if you short the market, you're going to be crushed because markets go up in hyperinflation. So I, you need to know where we are in, in terms of inflation and especially uh, in the context of inflation and the context of growth. And then those five sectors between, so it's deflation, disinflation, stasis, reflation, and stagflation or hyperinflation. And then you'll know every single investment bucket has its own investment style. Sometimes it's wonderful for gold and sometimes it's horrible. Gold hates reflation because rates are rising and the economy is doing well um, in sector four. Uh, you can get killed. But in sectors in sector two and in one, you can make a lot of money in gold because gold loves, like I said, falling nominal and real interest rates. So... And maybe even sector five, gold should do fantastic. And say, I, I think because real rates, even though even though rates will be rising, nominal rates will be rising. In real terms, they should be lagging inflation. So, and that's the case. That's the actual best environment for gold. Michael, allow me one last summary question here. And what what should the average Joe's portfolio look like going uh, until the end of the year? If if you were to start blank, how would you allocate right now? So, and so I don't not so just not financial advice or anything, right? It's just more of a just to yeah. sort of almost like a summary question to what you just mentioned. So I'm not going to give your clients or, or the audience. I have to do fiduciary, you know, due diligence on them. I can tell you where I am at. Um, and I don't invest for the end of the year. I invest for what's happening now, which is August 19th um, and the next few months. So I, I, I am invest, invested for disinflation with an eye out for the 
IDEC model to signal when we should go into deflation. So I don't think it, I don't think economic growth is accelerating. As I, we laid out on this interview, economic growth is decelerating. We have inflation on the second derivative, which is falling. So that's dis, that's disinflation, and that requires bond and bond proxy investments. So it's uh, utilities, it's low beta stocks, it's gold, um, and it's treasuries. Um, primarily, I do have some hedges. I am short high yield. Uh, I'm I am I have been long India for a quite a long time. Um, it's still working. So, but I have an eye out for that. When to exit that, and uh, and I'll and again I'll follow my model to let me know when to get more cautious in the portfolio. Perfect, Michael. Thank you so much for your time. Where can we follow, uh, follow you and find more of your work? So it's pentoport.com is the website. Um, on that website is something called the Midweek Reality Check, uh, which is a weekly podcast I put out every Wednesday night. I'll give you the economic data of of the week, how I interpret it. Um, the real, the salient data that you need to understand. And I'll also talk a little bit on a very high level about where I'm positioned. I'm not going to give specifics. Obviously that obviously that's for my clients. Um, and, um, and if you have a hundred thousand dollars to invest, I will invest your money in my strategy and you're a U.S. citizen. Fantastic. Awesome. Michael, really appreciate of your time. Thanks so much for sharing your insights. Super insightful. Really always enjoyed chatting with you. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this conversation here with Michael Pento of Pento Portfolio Strategies. If you did, please leave a like, leave a, uh, leave a subscribe to the channel, of course, and comment. How are you positioned right now? How are you playing the economy? And uh, do you agree with Michael's views? Like, do you have a contradicting opinion? I'd love to hear from it because it also influences what kind of questions I ask up upcoming interviews as well. So much appreciate you watching. Watching. Much appreciate you tuning in. Subscribe, like, and follow. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be back with lots more. Thank you.